Welcome everyone. My name is Kaya and uh, welcome to the Sortie 2022 conference. If you're just joining us for the first time or if you've been to other events, regardless, um, note that this session is recorded and it's later going to be shared on our OSF meeting platform. All these links will be shared in the chat in a moment. Before I introduce our plenary presenter, I have a few announcements. First, we ask that all participants familiarize themselves with the Code of Conduct, conduct which is available at Sortie.org and the link will also be shared in the chat. For detailed information on all the events, please check the conference information pack, and that link will also be in the chat. Some information about the conference is available at sortie.org slash events, but this does not include the links to the Zooms for events. You can find the list of all Zoom links in a Google Sheet, which you can also find in the conference pack or in the Shiny app. We ask that you keep these Zoom links private and ask anyone interested in joining to subscribe to the conference through the Eventbrite page. Please note that discussions are also happening in Slack. Um, see the conference information pack for information on how to navigate the Slack workspace. For example, this plenary has a Slack channel dedicated to it that you can um, post questions or discussion in that, in that channel. We're very excited for this plenary and for the other plenaries at the conference. And we're also very much looking forward to the interactive events where you can participate in shaping a more open, reliable, and transparent future for ecology and evolutionary biology. Well, we hope that you'll find one or more of these events to attend. Okay, now for a few details about this plenary. First, um, note that you can each turn off or leave on the automatic captioning that you see at the bottom of your screen by clicking on the live transcription button. We also invite you to ask questions in the Q&A function of Zoom while the presentation is happening. And if you see questions from other, present, from other attendees, you can upvote any other question that you find interesting. After the presentation, I'll select the questions from the Q&A in order of the number of upvotes and read them to the presenter. Um, after about 15 minutes of Q&A, we will leave the webinar and move over to a regular Zoom meeting so we can have a little bit of a less structured Q&A and so everybody can see each other's faces. The link is available in the conference information pack and my co-host will also post that link in the chat when it's time to migrate. In the other Zoom meeting, um, we'll divide into breakout groups to discuss the presentation and interact with the presenter in small groups. And any other questions that you have that don't get addressed during the Q&A session can always be posted in the Slack channel dedicated to this plenary um, and discussions from the post plenary mixer can be continued there. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Dr. C. T. Nguyen is a professor of philosophy at the University of Utah. He's interested in art, games, trust and communities, including online communities and echo chambers. His recent book called Games, Agency as Art discusses how games shape temporary agencies for artistic purposes and was awarded the American Philosophical Association's 2021 Book Prize. Dr. Nguyen has written about trust, online echo chambers, and public discourse for the New York Times, the New Statesman, and Boston Review, among other publications. He has appeared on the Mindscapes podcast and the Ezra Klein Show. Today, he will be speaking about the complicated relationship between transparency and trust. And without further ado, you may begin. Hi everyone, uh, let's start this slideshow. Can you see the, the slides? They look good. Okay, awesome. Hi, I'm Tino and I'm a philosopher. I gather most of you are scientists, so I will try to not alienate myself from everyone and make myself seem like a complete fool. Um, the talk I'm going to give you, I think, is a lot more suspicious about transparency than uh, a lot of the other conversation from what I can gather um, in this conference. Um, let me give you a little bit of background. So the talk I'm about to give you is at the intersection of two or three different research streams I've been engaged in. One of my research streams has been about the nature of trust. And in particular, a particular question that is old as Socrates that I've been obsessed with that people in philosophy for a long time wouldn't accept as an interesting topic. And that was how does a non-expert correctly pick which expert to trust when that expertise is not in their understanding, right? So that, that for me was, a, interestingly, people uh, came to understand that this was a reasonable uh, topic of research sometime around the Trump era. Um, so that was one stream of research. Another stream of research I've been really interested in, uh, I do a lot of work on um, the philosophy of games and the nature of games. And in the book that I wrote on games, I became really interested in the central 
role of point structures in games. So my kind of games are something like, okay, everyone else has games or something like a fiction, but I actually think they're more. What they are is a game is a form of agency. A game designer tells you not only what you can do, but what you want, and they do that through points. Uh, my favorite game designer, Reiner Knizia, had this amazing talk where he said that the most important tool in the game designer's toolbox is the point system, because the points tell you what to care about during the game. So I went off and ended up doing a huge amount of research about points, about quantification, and this incredibly rich stream of research about the impact of metrics and the impact in particular and the impact in politics of oversimplified quantification systems. And I've ended up writing about, I wrote about this at the end of the games book, but my current research project is about a phenomenon I'm calling value capture. Um, value capture is what happens when your values are rich and subtle and you enter some kind of space that offers you simplified and typically quantified versions of your values, like a Fitbit or Twitter likes or citation rates or impact factor, right? And when those take over, I think what ends up happening is that they simplify our values and they simplify them in the direction of what's easily and institutionally recordable. Just for the scientists in the room, think for example about the massive gap between why you might care about doing your research and your citation rates or your H index. For those of you on Twitter, think about the gap between all the reasons you might have to communicate and say the simple metric of Twitter likes um, and Twitter retweets. So from that work, I originally had a footnote about transparency metrics, and that footnote has grown to be a paper. That paper is now published. Hopefully there's a link to it. And I'm going to give you this paper now. Uh, the one caveat, the use of transparency I have here is slightly skewed to how some of you are using transparency. This is a little less about uh, open science in the sense of making your data available to other scientists. And it's in particular about public accountability, which I think is what some of you are interested in, but not all of you are interested in. So I used to be clear, this is originally a paper about the place of public metrics and accountability in politics. Um, and the use of transparency here is a use from a certain public sector of discussion and not necessarily the, the way transparency is used in all the discussions of open science. So just a caveat to start. So. This starts for me with this moment from Anara O'Neill. Anara O'Neill was a very, in philosophy, was a really famous and influential bioethicist. Um, and in her BBC Rife lectures about trust, she wrote this. This is just one paragraph. Most people in my field have ignored this. And I haven't really seen this thought picked up in a lot of other people, by a lot of other people. But when I saw this, I was just, well, my slides have gone nuts. Come on, go backwards. Okay. Um, I was really, really startled uh, by how right it seemed. So she writes, transparency can encourage people to be less honest, so increasing deception and reducing reasons for trust. Those who know that everything they write or say or write is to be made public may massage the truth. People may underplay sense of information. Head teachers and employees may make blandly informative reports and references. Evasive and uninformative statements may substitute for truth telling. Demands for universal transparency are likely to encourage the evasions, hypocrisies, and hypocrisies that we usually refer to as political correctness, but which might be forth rightly be called either self-censorship or deception. So that argument seems to strike at me at something really, really deep. And I, I, I just want to spend basically this talk working out the depth of that comment. So I want to explicate her argument, I want to defend it, and I actually want to make things worse from what Anara O'Neill says. So there's a lot of threads to the argument, but I want to simplify it and emphasize one part of it. So a lot of people think that trust and transparency go together, but they're actually at odds. Transparency demands that experts justify their reasoning to non-experts, but expert reasons are by definition incomprehensible to experts, so transparency forces deception. That's O'Neill's argument. I want to actually add to this. So her view is basically something like the experts will do the same thing and under systems of transparency, they'll generate fake reasons that are comprehensible to non-experts. My worry uh, is that there's actually another cycle to this argument, that transparency combines experts to non-expert available reasons, and then experts won't act exactly as the same as they would before and just invent rationalizations 
for post hoc consumption. That is, in some cases, they may change their actions to make their actions more explicable to non-experts. To that extent, I'm worried transparency will undermine expertise. Uh, so there are a lot of examples of this from the literature. I just, by the way, for those of you that are interested, what I'm drawing on, and I'll give you a few references, there's a really rich literature in sociology, anthropology, communication studies, and history about what's called quantification culture. Um, uh, you can find it by Googling sociology of quantification, and it's really, really interesting. So I'm gonna give you some highlights from this literature, but a few case studies first. So a few of you may know about uh, uh, these websites, Charity Navigator and Charity Watch. So Charity, uh, these are websites that say that they're gonna give us oversight over charities, and they rate, rate charities on transparency, accountability, and effectiveness. So I used Charity Navigator a lot in my life. I, I not only used it, to guide my donations, but I used it in my ethics classes. I put it online and I actually used to do an exercise where I would have the students, I was gonna give $100 to charity and the students would argue among themselves about which was the most effective charity. And we use Charity Navigator, right? It turns out a major part of their score is something called throughput, which is the more of contributors' money gets through to the target, the less that's spent internally, the higher rate the rating. So the idea is to reduce administrative waste and internal overhead. So this seems like a really good metric. A lot of people accept this metric. I looked at this metric and I thought, this is a great metric. It turns out, according to experts in the nonprofit industry, that below a certain point, cutting administrative costs makes charities worse at their jobs. Imagine if your departments were rated on how little you spent internally on hiring employees and administrative overhead, right? So right now, what the experts in this space say is that charities are being forced to operate with painfully thin internal budgets, too thin to be effective in order to get a good rank on Charity Navigator. Here's another case study from Sally Engel Mary. Sally Engel Mary is an anthropologist who specializes in human rights work. And she ended up participating in the generation of UN metrics about, uh, there's, a set of UN, there's a set of UN rankings about which countries do better and worse in human rights uh, development. And what she ends up saying is that in many cases, the rankings that get generated are profoundly subjective, complicated, oversimplifying, sorry, subjective, oversimplifying, and uh, involve a lot of political decisions that are hidden from view. But once the ranking is generated, people focus entirely on the ranking and many government officials' uh, decisions are based entirely on what will move them up this ranking. Uh, she has this example that I found particularly devastating. In, uh, she has two chapters on this example. Show the State Department, our, the US State Department has a, something called the Sex Trafficking Index, which rates countries on how well they're doing to reduce sex trafficking. This is the primary index that various countries use to reflect and rate their performance in reducing self, sex trafficking. What she says is, since the State Department has a law and order policing mindset, the index is entirely generated by looking at rates of convictions of sex traffickers. But convictions, the policing approach, is it the only available approach? So what she ends up saying is, here's another way to get rid of sex trafficking in an area, reduce ambient poverty, right? Poverty leads to sex trafficking. But if you reduce sex, uh, sex trafficking by poverty, your conviction rate falls simply because there are fewer sex traffickers to convict. So reducing sex trafficking by reducing poverty shows up as a failure on the sex trafficking index, which is the primary index being used right now by various governmental officials. So this is an apparently good metric for performance, which makes sense to non-experts, but it turns out in the eyes of experts to be a blunt instrument. So here's the worry. Transparency forces experts to be ruled by metrics that are comprehensible to non-experts, but it can draw ex and it can draw experts to reason using these non-expert comprehensible metrics, which undermine to some substantial effect their expertise. Um, th this, is, this slide is basically the summary of the rest of the talk. So hope th this is what I'm gonna try to show. Third case study. Th by the way, I should say that this paper is partially an act of therapy and catharsis for parts of my own previous life. I served as assessment liaison officer for my department for seven years. That meant generating metrics for good education learning outcomes. Um, in this case, I was the liaison for a philosophy department and I had to generate metrics that were comprehensible to members of the Utah State Legislature. So here are the metrics currently in use by my university. 
uh, that I had to give quantitative data for uh, that we supported. One is graduation rate, another is graduation speed, another is employment rate and income of recently graduated students, another is student satisfaction as reported on alley evaluations. Notice some things that are not in the measured educational learning outcomes. Increasing thoughtfulness, increasing self-reflection, increasing intellectual virtue, and increasing humility. These are all things that in philosophy departments we actually care about in teaching, but for which we possess no readily accessible, widely accepted measure. So th those are the case studies. So here's the focus of the paper. I'm focusing on one type of transparency. Uh, I'm gonna call assessment transparency. Assessment transparency is a directive that some process may be made available for assessment by outsiders, right? Notice that this account, this notion of transparency doesn't on its face include a lot of the kind of data sharing that you get in open science. This is, tr this is transparency for the sake of assessment and evaluation by outsiders. So there are two forms, right? One. It, I want to call expert transparency, is that a process by one set of experts be made accessible for, uh, 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 and valuable to others possessing the same expertise. For example, one lab of epidemiologists making their data available for other epidemiologists to check. The other form is public transparency, which is that a pro some process be made accessible by the general public or their representatives, like state legislators. So I'm going to focus on the problems, I'm going to primarily focus on the problems with public transparency. This is where I said this doesn't, this runs skew to some of the concerns of open science, but I think it matches with some other concerns with open science. So, um, so and I mean available here quite robustly. So what it is to be available is that the process be expressible in terms that are comprehensible to the general public. So example, if I'm a Bayesian economist, and I just put just dump my spreadsheets for that explanation on some website online. That does not yet count as public transparency because that information isn't available. Availability involves some kind of translation. So I'm looking at assessment transparency, and it might seem at first that data sharing transparency seems to be of a different kind. But I just want to point out that in many cases, data sharing transparency can be repurposed for assessment purposes. That is, if we put information online for data sharing, and that's readily available to anyone, then it can be used for assessment. So one thing we know from people like Naomi Oresis is that in many cases, um, tobacco research into the harms of tobacco that were made available under open science initiatives were later repurposed for assessment by hostile Congress people. And this is actually, uh, I just want you to imagine, maybe this will strike less with a scientist than with humanities people, but imagine that your university says they're going to put every single one of your lectures and student meetings online because your teaching is so awesome, they want to share it for the, with the rest of the world. It seems fairly clear that the moment that stuff is online, it can also be reused for assessment. I mean, one, if I'm not sure, I'm not sure if this matters as much for people in the sciences, but in the humanities, um, at the beginning of COVID, there was, a, there was a directive that, oh, maybe we want to put every single recorded lecture online immediately accessible to everyone. And all of us were immediately like, oh my God, we teach on critical race theory and on the politics of feminism. The alt-right is going to come for us if you put that online, right? So just, just to point out that in reuse, uh, that reuse transparency can be repurposed in many ways. And so many of the worries that I have about assessment transparency will also apply to a lesser degree to reuse transparency. Okay, and here's the big claim that I wanna make today. Transparency is intended to, and certainly does curtail corruption, but my worry, I'm not claiming that it doesn't have that effect. My worry is that there's a price, that there's a major downside. So my claim isn't going to be get rid of transparency. I think we need transparency. My claim is going to be that transparency is a form of very aggressive surveillance that's both very valuable and very costly, like all other forms of surveillance, and should be used judiciously and with a careful eye to its cost. All right, what's the cost? I'm going to give you two versions of the argument about the cost. Here's the master argument. For those that are following along, in the final published paper, I think in the published paper, I call this the epistemic intrusion argument. So this argument should be really straightforward. Expertise often requires acting from reasons that aren't available to non-experts. So some of these are explicit reasonings that require training and specialized knowledge, but a lot of this is tacit knowledge. So, and 
So you'll see from any of the philosophical work, the psychological work and expertise, a lot of what we think of as expertise emerges in the form of skilled perception intuitions. So, so famously, for example, a trained emergency room doctor can walk into a room and almost immediately, the people that are the most sick will pop out to them and they will be able to see kind of what in the report as a direct way that this person has this particular problem or that person has something wrong with their lungs, right? It, it's available to immediate trained perception. Public transparency on expert processes demands that experts limit themselves in some way to those actions that uh, uh, to those actions that can be um, give they, they can give some public justification, which limits them to actions that can be justified in non-expert terms. This is I'm going to spend the rest of to, this time working out the consequences of this argument, but this is really the core argument, right? Expert, what it is to be an expert is to have some reasons available to you that aren't available generally. And transparency to varying degrees asks you to explain yourself in reasons that are understandable to everyone, which leaves out a very large set of your reasons for action. And to the extent that you limit yourself to the actions for which you can give justification, then the demand for transparency will undermine your ability to act from your expert understanding. So the argument here is not that there are some examples of bad metrics. The argument here is that the essential logic of public transparency, that is offering justification to all, is in tension with expertise. Here's another way to put it. One thing that a lot of philosophers believe in and a lot of people in general believe in is the standard of public reason. You should be able to justify yourself to everyone in the public. Another thing we believe in is expertise, which is knowing things that the public does not know. The point of these talk are these two beliefs are in profound tension, are in many ways irresolvable tension. Wow, I see so many frowns on my screen. This is delicious. So um, I just want to point out that expert, non-expert here is not supposed to be a binary classification, that most of us are non-experts in most domains, even if we're an expert in one domain. So the old, there's an old worry about a certain kind of elitist version of democracy, which sets some particular class of people as the experts and the rest as the public who are ruled. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that knowledge in the world is so complicated that each of us has expertise at most over 0.001% of the world. And so in aggregate, we're non-experts about everything. This is a problem that will apply if everyone in the world has a PhD, right? An expert is an expert in most things. So how much does transparency undermine expertise? The answer is going to be, it depends. So there are two loci for transparency assessments. One is the outputs, that is uh, assessing something in terms of what the process outputs, and the other is the deliberation, that is assessing people on the justifications decided, uh, used in deciding particular actions. By the way, this is a spectrum concept, not a simple binary. So for example, output transparency, examples, assessing doctors on live saves, assessing doctors on cases closed. Deliberative transparency would look like assessing doctors on justifications for prescribing particular drugs in terms of specified diagnostic criteria and assessing particular budgetary requests in terms of data-driven demonstrations of efficacy of each particular line item. By the way, that last one I didn't make up. That's from my current department life. Um, so output transparency demands that experts give justification in terms of understandable and monitorable outputs. This actually leaves a lot of leeway for decisions about particular actions. So you still have to hit the target, that's a major constraint, but sub decisions about how to hit the target are screened off from public oversight. So for example, if my department knows that we're gonna be judged on graduation rates and student evaluations, we can make lots of micro decisions out of the public eye as long as we're gonna hit that target. Deliberative transparency yields far less leeway in that each individual decision needs to be understandable to the public. So deliberative transparency is more intrusive. Output transparency limits expertise about final target selection and binds the target to what non-experts can understand, but deliberative transparency binds the reasoning and particular action choice to what non-experts can understand. So O'Neill's assumption was that uh, experts will act the same as always, but then deliver false justification for their actions. I think there are two even worse possibilities that we should consider. Um, one is limitation. That is that experts will limit their actions to those for which they can find some public justification. And two is guidance. 
experts will actually seek or prefer publicly available reasons in their own deliberations on how to act. D does the difference between those two make sense? So what limitation is, is something like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to look at all the actions I could take for my own reasons as an expert. And then I'm going to sort and find the ones that I can find some public justification for, not maybe my actual reasons, right? But that'll present a limitation on what I, on my choices, but it's not going to actually intrude into the, into the particular details of my reasoning. In guidance, that is the case when experts actually start to use internalized metrics internalize as their target metrics that are built to be comprehensible to non-experts and then use those as their actual goals and in guiding their actions. That's the most intrusive. So for example, limiting transparency. Doctors might be food, sued unless they can find some plausible diagnosis to attach a prescription to. By the way, I asked my friend who's an emergency room psychiatrist how many times he made his diagnosis intu intuitively and then backwards found some justification that would work in the insurance manuals. And he said 95%. So that's that's how it works. Guiding transparency might happen if you, for example, incentivized hitting the targets, like rewarding or funding university departments based on graduation rates, or rewarding police chiefs with higher salaries for higher case closure rates, or reporting nonprofits with better throughput ratings for higher donations. And I think in many cases, guiding transparency is what we actually see uh, due to the structure of incentives, the relationship of incentives and metrics. So. O'Neill's deception uh, outcome depends on the possibility of enormous leeway that we take the presumption that we take the same actions under transparency as we would without and then invent alternative public reasons. So that depends on ineffective monitoring uh, and the lack of incentive of a relationship between incentives and metrics. But transparency regimes are more intrusive where justifications need to be tied to data that's collected externally. Um, will yield something like the limitation or guidance outcomes. So here's the basic problem in a nutshell of what I've said so far. Transparency metrics can't capture expert value and reasoning. The less leeway there is, the more metrics push out expertise. Okay, that's the first argument. Here's the second argument. I haven't yet decided this may or may not be actually deeply just a restatement of the first argument, but at least on the surface, it looks different. So one, Long-standing communities develop shared reasons that aren't always accessible to those outside the community. Call those intimate reasons. Two, properly assessing intimate reasons often requires long familiarity, long familiarity with a particular context or a long history of shared communal deliberations. Three, both expert transparency and public transparency undermine the use of these shared developed reasons. So transparency undermines the intimate reasoning of communities. What are some examples of these intimate reasons? So for my life, a sense of what an interesting question is, an aesthetic sense of what good flow is in rap, or a sense of cool and skateboard tricks, or I work with game designers, the game designer's sense of physical friction in games, but also an oppressed community sense of what terms are and aren't demeaning, or an oppressed community sense of what acts of cultural appropriation are and aren't permissible. So why might there be intimate reasons? So a standard view that many people hold right now is that some reasons are only convincing to those who have had that experience. For example, the standard one that I think a lot of you probably subscribe to is that people who've lived under racism or some other specific form of oppression understand the weight of certain considerations with more heightened clarity. They understand the force of them better than someone who hasn't actually lived their life under that experience. So another category of intimate reason would be aesthetic reasons that come from being immersed in some kind of aesthetic community. So I just wanna point out at this point but that most of the time people imagine transparency in a particular paradigm. They always imagine like some public figure who's kind of corrupt and oversight over them conducted by a good and competent public. But a lot of times this is actually flipped. So in many cases of transparency, what I see is cases of transparency over a well-intentioned minority advocacy group conducted by an insensitive set of public representatives or a rush public. By the way, this section is also autobiographical. I watched a fight. I teach in Utah and our university has an LGBTQ support group and they had to make their decisions transparent to the Utah state legislature, right? And in particular, I saw a fight over line item budgetary requests for safe spaces, right? Where the 
weight and importance of safe spaces was not apparent to the Utah public in a way that was finally apparent to, to the LGBTQ support group, right? Here's another way to, um, here's another way to put it. A lot of people here probably believe in what in my profession, we call standpoint epistemology, but which I think can be stated just as the view that if you've lived life under a particular form of oppression, you have special understandings of that life that aren't available to people that haven't loved under that oppression. The point is that that view is in profound tension with the demand for public reason and the demand for public transparency. Because public transparency embeds into it the expectation that your reasons will be widely accepted and universally accepted. So if you think that there are some reasons that are only apparent if you've lived life under something like a particular form of oppression, then you can't think that every good reason will be appreciated as such by the public in general, right? So another way to put it is part of the core of this paper is the observation that progressives are typically committed to two things. One is public transparency and another is the belief that living under oppression gives you special understanding and then pointing out that these are in deep tension and that if you solve totally for public transparency you're going to eliminate your acceptance of this other stuff um i already said that okay so um so step back one way to put the point in large is that there's a tension between transparency practices and respect for expertise and i think one way to, to reflect on this philosophically there has long been a standard of intellectual autonomy that expects people to be that expects people to evaluate for themselves every intellectual domain they come in contact with. This is now a fantasy, as uh, Elijah Milgram puts it in the book *The Great Endarkenment*. The the essential feature of the epistemic condition of our era is the vast hyper-specialization of the sciences, which means that no human being can actually evaluate the entirety of a practical argument to a conclusion. What he suggests is the standard of intellectual autonomy is an outmoded principle which evolved at a time when the sciences were small enough for one Renaissance person to understand. That doesn't work anymore. My suggestion is that the demand for public transparency writes the standard of intellectual autonomy into policy. Does that make sense? That it is, that it is based on the, the thought that we can have unlimited public transparency is based on the fantasy of total intellectual autonomy that doesn't work anymore. And as I said before, there's also a tension between the claim that reasons should be publicly accessible and the thought that different groups, especially oppressed groups, have special understandings. That's the main argument. Now I'm gonna give you some commentary and big hand-waving and then we'll get to Q&A. One response might be, but doesn't the public have a right to control what they fund? So let's narrow down now to publicly funded cases, like the sciences, research, art grants, academics at public schools. So Philip Kitcher in Science, Truth, and Democracy said that there isn't a single clear value that you guide all the sciences, like pure understanding. There's only different projects guided by different values. And insofar as the public fund science, they should set the values that guide publicly funded science. So here's a counter proposal to what I've said that we could imagine. Imagine that, well, let's accept that we should get rid of deliberative transparency, but what about outcome transparency? So doctors use all kinds of complex reasoning, but the outcomes are clear, right? Lives saved. In other words, expertise might be applied to the means, but it's in the service of the public conceptions of the good. Wouldn't this get rid of a lot of the problems I've, just, I've given? I'm really worried about that. And let me give you an example first. So this is from Jennifer Lina's entitled. Jennifer Lina is an incredible sociologist of music history. Entitled is a study of the history of American arts funding. So she notes that when the National Endowment for the Arts was under the direct control of Congress, Congress people accused the NEA's experts of pork barreling and corruption because many of the funded projects were flops. That is, they didn't make a ton of money. So Congress started demanding under the aegis of transparency that NEA only fund artworks that would be box office successes. So here's the thought underneath this. The values of something are evident to people with expertise and, uh, with expertise and experience in the area. Um, the worry is in an area where the deep value is expert laden, then the movement to a publicly accessible measure will eliminate some of the expertise understanding of the value. So another way to put it is the counter proposal 
depends on the idea that expertise is merely instrumental and the proper targets in a domain are understandable to the general public. But what the, this example suggests is in many cases, expertise is required to understand what's really valuable. Tal Brewer, a philosopher I love, says in the retrieval of ethics, and it takes a long time of an activity to really see its value. And that expertise is in part a more fine grained and full understanding of what the value in the activity is. So what can we do about this in cases of public funding? So one possibility is, as Kitcher suggests, that experts set that, um, that the non-experts set the desired outcome in all its details. Another possibility is the public sets the outcome in some general view and the expert fills out the nature of that outcome. So you can, uh, you, we could divide this into two possibilities. Value handoff, where the public specifies the value in general, like the value of art, the value of reflection, the value of the humanities, the values of ecology, and the experts fill out what the value looks like. And direct, the other possibility is direct output transparency, where the public specifies and then picks the very metric, including the evaluative standard, by which success is measured. So direct output transparency will only work for those. So if you can see, the, my worry is that what this ends up looking like is, for example, the public saying, well, look, college is doing a good job of people make a lot of money because it assumes that the value of an education is money, right? And I think the idea is that for a lot of us, once you've spent time with education, you realize the only the value in it isn't only making more money. So direct output transparency works for those domains in which there's something which I have called before a litmus test. So a litmus test is an assessment of an output that's available to non-experts. So for example, you might think that bridge engineering is a domain with a litmus test, but we can assess whether bridge, it, because non-experts can tell good bridge engineering from bad engineering, bridge engineering because bad bridges fall down. But I think there's a major problem of false litmus tests where it's due to inexpertise Non-experts think they have a good litmus test. Examples. So charity navigators throughput metric, red wine versus white wine. I love this example. So they're all there. I saw a bunch of scientific studies discrediting the wine world because wine experts couldn't tell the difference between, between red wine and white wine. It turns out the belief that red wine and white wine taste obviously different is a novice mistake. Because people in the wine world know that there's crisp, clear, light, delicate red wines and big, thick, heavily oaked white wines. And the idea that that's a good test depends on knowing so little about wine that you think that red and white wines are just two simple polar opposites. Or say the view, the view that education is value only if it leads to a salary. So does this make sense? So the worry is if you have non-experts picking the metric, they will think, they might think that they have a good litmus test, but they don't realize it's not a good litmus test because they're an expert. Another way to put this is if you believe in something like the Dunning-Kruger effect, public transparency metrics can build that in to the standard of evaluation. Because if you're an, inex does that make sense? If you're an expert, you won't understand that the, st the standard of evaluation you picked is a bad one. So here's another way to put it. There might very well be a reliable test for expertise, but the direct output transparency standard requires that non-experts properly identify the litmus test. And this just pushes the old expert identification problem up one step. It doesn't really solve it. Here's another problem. And I think this is actually deeper. This is the magnetism of clear litmus tests. So the worry is that activities might be reformulated around available litmus tests, that we might think that medicine might come to be more oriented towards the measurable outcomes, like saving lives and increasing lifespan, over less measurable ones, like well-being, whatever the hell that is. Or that education might become more oriented towards measurable outcomes like standardized test scores, employment rates, satisfaction surveys versus less measurable ones like wisdom or the cultivation of virtue or reflection. Uh, actually, the clearest example of this happened in a talk. I was giving some of this material and someone raised their hand and they said, well, what about an area like where, we, where what the point is, is just clear and quantifiable. For example, you know, the point of fitness is to lose weight and we can just measure that. And I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Where did we get to the point where we thought that the point of fitness was losing weight? And the worry is that for a lot of people, that activity has become reformulated around that goal because that's the clear measurable goal and not something like the aesthetic pleasure in interesting exercise or the joy and spirit, whatever. You get the idea. Okay, grand finale. Transparency is surveillance. <clears throat> so 
standard definition of surveillance from the ethics of surveillance literature. Surveillance is heightened attention paid because of the possibility of bad action. So transparency of the sort I've been talking about, assessment transparency, is definitionally a particular kind of surveillance. You might call it bureaucratic surveillance. It's a monitoring of activities to make sure they're appropriately justified. It arises, I mean, you can actually see this in the, 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 the history of transparency arises from worries about bias and corruption in politicians. <clears throat> One thing we know from the ethics of surveillance literature is that surveillance destroys intimacy and privacy and creates paranoia. It destroys the possibility of intimate reasoning and creates the paranoia of justification, the sense that you have to justify to someone who shares no context and no sympathy all of your actions. And it can get, bring you to restrict your actions to those that can be justified some decontextualized overseer perpetually looking over one's shoulder. One way to put the point of this is that public reason can also be thought of decontextual as decontextualized reason. Sorry, but maybe that's too telegraphic. So here's the claim. In general, what we think is that surveillance is occasionally justified, but it has a high price. So we shouldn't surveil everybody all the time. Instead, the standard view is that surveillance is only justified in proportion to the probability of wrongdoing and the degree of consequence. But I want to point out is the standard view of transparency in our culture is the more transparency, the better. So unlimited transparency, right? And I'm saying that that's the same as, as plumping for unlimited surveillance. Here's another way to put it. This is really the core idea of the talk. The realm that is hidden from public oversight, the realm of the intuitive, and the inexplicable is where bias hides and corruption flourishes. I totally admit that. I'm only claiming that it's also where expert skill often resides, sensitivity flourishes and intimacy lives. And my claim is that transparency destroys both of them, right? It's rough medicine. So we tend to treat transparency as wholly good, the more the better. But I'm suggesting as we actually should think it's that this is an intrusive form of bureaucratic surveillance, which profoundly limits expertise and intimacy. And we need it to expose bias and corruption, but we also need to trust and not to demand transparency to let, in some cases, to let expertise, sensitivity, and intimacy flourish. Here's another way to put it. The world is radically hyper-specialized. Most domains of expertise are not directly accessible to most people. We need to trust because we need to be able to deal in domains where we don't have expertise. But because of the inaccessibility problem, we can't fully secure that trust of our own. As Annette Beyer, the great philosopher of trust put it, trust puts us in a position of essential vulnerability. One response is to try to eliminate this vulnerability and to rein in experts uh, to bring them back into your site. But this imposes on experts a limitation of being justificatorily limited by the understanding of the non-experts, which are in most cases us. So what's the solution to this? Let me pause for a drink of water before the grand finale. There's no solution. Um, the trust between tension and transparency is essential. It arises from the hyper-specialized nature of human knowledge. And I think in each case, we just get to choose where the slider goes. There's a painful compromise between trusting in experts and reining them in. In each decision, you get to choose where you put the slider and where you make the compromise. And you might choose differently because each situation has different dangers. That's it, thanks. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, we can take questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom, um, or you can message your questions to any of the, uh, either the presenter or to any of the hosts in the chat um, or in the Slack. Uh, I figure I'll kick it off with one while we wait for questions to come in. Um, so I was curious as you were talking about the, dis about the question of when the surveillance and transparency is implemented, because I think in particular when we're talking about open science and open data right now, we're at this interesting juncture where a lot of these practices have not yet been put into place, but are starting to be put into place. And I think what you're talking about with incentives and um, trust and changes to experts behavior has a really different answer depending on whether that transparency is put in sort of after the fact or at the beginning. So I wonder if you could speak to that. So I'm not entirely sure why, uh, why the timing matters. Maybe you can explain more why you think the timing matters. So, it, so 
consider any case. So there are two cases I'm really interested in. One is when it gets when some some publicly available metric gets attached to incentives, and another that I didn't talk about as much is when some publicly uh, available metric gets internalized and taken on as the main target. So for example, think of researchers who just think the citation rate is the thing they should be going for. That, that, that's their new definition of success. That's actually the thing I'm most interested in. Um, so insofar as a non-expert understanding of the value of the activity becomes the target, I'm not sure why it matters whether that target gets placed partway through the activity or placed early in the activity. So one of the things that's really interesting to me in the sociological literature is the degree to which a lot of the movements that begin with a simplified brute metric are incredibly valuable in the early part of the life cycle of the metric and then come to be um, deeply damaging later on, later on. So the first place I heard of this was, do you know about the move to quantify policing in New York? So I see some nods, some not nods. So New York, at some point, people realized, oh my God, some of the New York police districts are incredibly corrupt. And so they created the system where they monitored something called the case closure rate. So if you've ever seen The Wire, this is the center of what The Wire is about. So the case closure rate is how many reported cases get closed and solved. Um, so they started measuring that for every precinct and tying police superintendent and police commissioner salary to the case closure rate. Over the first five years, everyone thinks what happened was an incredible reduction in bias. That system quickly figured out which precincts were incredibly corrupt and like opened up them up to light, things got a lot better. After about five years, things started getting uh, way more fucked up. So basically, uh, in order to improve, commissioners start competing on the metric and to complete on the metric, there is a gap between actual good police action and the case closure rate. And you can manipulate that gap in all kinds of ways, as I'm sure you can th easily think of. Among other things, some police commissioners started making it harder to report cases, especially harder to report. The so um, rape is particularly highly weighted in the system and very hard to close. And so you started finding commis police commissioners creating more labyrinths and bureaucratic methods to make rape harder to report. You also get things like a lot of the, what look to people like people, police officers going out and just handing out traffic tickets um, and issuing like what look to a lot of people like stupid citations uh, are because those change the numbers of the case closure rates, right? So you get this gaming of the rate of the rate down the line. I, I'm not sure if that fully answers the question. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Thank you. Um, we have a couple in the Q and A. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the Q and A, but I'm going to read the question just for everyone's benefit. Um, so we have a question: What about the argument that experts need to educate non-experts regarding the, their field? Is that feasible? Is that a solution to the conflict that you describe? Yeah. So. So okay. The basic question is whether an expert can adequately explain the reasoning to a non-expert in a way that the non-expert would be able to distinguish that from the reasoning of a fake expert, right? So here, here's the gold standard. Can a genuine climate change scientist explain their reasoning in a way that a non-expert, a layperson would recognize as better than asshole on YouTube, right? Uh, so there are a lot of reasons to think this is non-feasible. Uh, there's, I mean, the world, look at it. Uh, there's a lot of studies about, uh, there's a lot of really interesting studies, empirical studies about experts on the witness stand. And it turns out that juries are beyond shit at recognizing real experts. Like juries tend to pick actual professional cons who, uh, right? So it turns out that juries tend to pick people that speak without qualification in simple terms. And that's not how experts actually take speak. So one response you might think is no, you need, uh, you could teach the non-experts enough to recognize good arguments. If we had unlimited time, we could do this, right? The problem is, again, remember that the entire problem here is driven by the vastness of the sciences. You can't actually t bring everyone up to speed enough to tell the difference between good arguments and bad arguments in different fields in every relevant field because of, and I mean, I'm, I, I, 
I spent a lot of time vetting these arguments with my wife. So my wife is a chemist. She does research. And I asked her, like, how, how, much, how much of what she does is reliant on things she doesn't understand and couldn't even... And she's like, look, the statistical passage, package I use to, like, analyze my... Uh, I, um, she does some kind of nuclear imaging. Like, uh, I don't even know, like, the thing I use every day, I don't know how that stuff works, right? Like, if you, if you try to go down the line and explain actually why certain climate change models work and other ones don't, you need to pretty quickly get to some pretty complex. I, I tried to see, do a test at one point to see, I'm fairly scientifically literate to see uh, at what point my understanding of the arguments in climate change science stopped. And it was really fast, right? Pretty quickly in the second paper, we were talking about fine grain differences in different modeling techniques and and I was like, I'm out, I'm done. I got a PhD in philosophy, not this, right? So, so the, the problem is that, so there's one model that says something like, if you already trust an expert, right? And you're willing to accept what they say, they can give you a vague sense of what's going on. But for assessment purposes, the transparency needs to separate between fakers and non-fakers, right? And that, demands a significant degree of expertise. Um, and if you're a non-expert, you might be able to come up to speed in two or three fields to do that, but not every field that you're in charge of. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, uh, hi T, thanks for the talk. I'm the philosopher in the room, so excuse the philosopher's question. You said that you were targeting public transparency because it means experts limit themselves to public justifications, which removes their tacit knowledge, et cetera. But surely the same applies to transparency within a discipline. Did we now have an argument against open science where scientists are expected to make absolutely transparent to each other how they got, for example, their data, processed it, did the analysis, because not all of this can or should be made transparent since these activities usually involve tacit knowledge, intuition, et cetera, which can now no longer be called on for justification. Right. P.S. I'm assuming that tacit knowledge and intuition can't readily be explicitly communicated amongst experts with the same knowledge and intuition. Perhaps not all would agree. Right. Okay. This is a great question. Um, and I think this went by really fast, but my way of putting it is that the expert, the epistemic expert argument doesn't necessarily apply to open science, but the intimacy argument does. So a simple way to put it is you might think that two different labs have the same expertise, but still might have different intimate understandings. So you'll get a differential between those arguments. So basically, but the one way to uh, one way to put it is that if you assume that the two bodies of experts, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm offering you a super simple model. If you assume that two groups of experts share the same tacit knowledge, that is, they have, they've been, though they're knowledge is tacit, their training has given them the same tacit knowledge, then the expert argument doesn't, or intrusion argument doesn't apply. So one version of this is one of my friends is a radiologist. Radiologist training is very tacit. Like he says the part of the training is you just look at an x-ray and you just see the cancer. And the thing is almost every trained radiologist sees exactly the same thing. Like they all look at the same slide. So in that case, the epistemic intrusion doesn't, doesn't, doesn't apply, right? precisely because um, two experts have the same tacit knowledge. The in so, so insofar as you think that different labs have different intimate understandings that won't be transferable between different lab communities, then that bit of the argument does apply. Um, and that's a reason, right? That's a reason to think uh, I mean, if you if you think to the degree that you think one particular local group has understandings that are not fully public, then the argument has some bite there, right? I mean, I don't think it's enough bite to say like, oh my God, let's stop with open science. But it's a reason to think, to be wary of the expectation that simply making data available will make everything else available too. Um, Great. Okay. Thank you. So it's basically the top of the hour. So we're going to switch over to a less formal Q and A Zoom where we can all actually see each other um, instead of having the participants hidden behind the webinar. Um, I'm going to post the link to that in the chat, um, and we will close this uh, webinar down and move over to the Zoom room where we'll be for um, half an hour until whatever half hour it is for you. 
Um, okay, so thanks everyone for attending and please feel free to post any further questions in the Slack channel or come to this um, Q&A. And um, we look forward to seeing you at upcoming uh, talks and, and hackathons in the rest of the conference.